Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the latest episode of PYA's Healthcare Regulatory Roundup webinar series. Today's topic is Billing Medicare for G2211, What You Need to Know Now. PYA is happy to present today's webinar on this important topic. You may submit questions during the webinar by typing a message into the questions pane of the control panel. Also, immediately following the end of the webinar, you will be asked to complete a short survey and submit any additional questions. We will respond to questions posed after the webinar via email. We posted in the handouts pane of the control panel a PDF copy of the slides for your reference. Also, you will receive an email later today with a copy of the slides and a recording of the webinar. With that, I would like to introduce our presenters. Angie Caldwell, Lori Foley, Valerie Rock, and Marty Ross. Good morning, and thank you for joining us today on uh, this episode of PYA's Healthcare Regulatory Roundup. I'm Marty Ross, a principal in PYA's Kansas City office. And today, to address the uh, new G2211 code, the complexity add on code, we've assembled our A team, um, starting with Valerie Rock, and a principal in our Atlanta office who is expert in physician revenue integrity, coding and billing. Um, Lori Foley, also in our Atlanta office, um, will bring the perspective of physician practice operations. And finally, joining us from the Tampa office is Angie Caldwell, um, who is an expert in physician compensation design, implementation and valuation. So let's jump right into our agenda. Uh, we're going to begin with sort of some perspective on how we ended up here. You know, my superpower is reading federal registers and trying to make sense of them. So I'll talk about how things evolved to January 1st of 2024 when this code first became reimbursable. Valerie will take Valerie will take over and discuss the basics. Then we'll move to Lori, who will talk about implementation strategies, and then Angie will bring us home looking at the physician compensation impacts. So let's start with how did we get here? And we have to go back uh, to summer and fall of 2020 not a place we necessarily want to visit but there we are back in the pandemic um, with everything else going on medicare uh, cms published the 2021 medicare physician fee schedule final rule which included some substantial revisions to the enm to the cpt codes uh, for evaluation at outpatient evaluation and management services um, and this was really a continuation of a multi-year initiative by CMS to clean up the E&M codes, bring them really into modern times. Um, and that included changes in how um, we determine the appropriate level for E&M services. But take particular note of the last two bullet points on this slide. Um, CMS significantly uh, increased the WR views assigned to these CPT codes. And it also introduced the complexity add-on code, um, which would be payable with these outpatient E&M codes with a valuation of just shy of a half of a, an RBU. In calculating the impact of this, um, CMS estimated um, that 90% of these codes would be billed um, with the add-on code. Um, so expected a very rapid and robust adoption of this new code uh, beginning in 2021. But we have to look at the impact these two changes would have on the overall Medicare physician fee schedule. Remember, unlike every other payment system in Medicare, the fee schedule, the physician fee schedule, is, does not have an automatic inflation adjustment. Instead, the amount of money we spend under the fee schedule is set by statute. And to increase that amount um, requires congressional action. So CMS each year starts with a pie, and it's all a matter of how you slice that pie up. And that becomes the conversion factor. So if you increase the number of available RVUs that are reimbursable, and you anticipate the use of those RVUs, then we're going to, if we're going to have, if we're going to pay for more things, we're going to pay less for each thing. So the impact of the ENM RVU adjustments and the introduction of G2211, um, as well as some other machinations of the fee schedule, uh, would have resulted in a 10.5% decrease in the conversion factor for 2021. Um, that was a 
$2.83 cut. So if you performed the same number of RVUs in 20 as you did in, in 21 as you did in 20, you'd be receiving 10.5% less in reimbursement. Obviously, in the middle of the pandemic, this was concerning. And Congress stepped in in the Consolidated Appropriations Act. Remember that monstrous piece of legislation that passed in December, late December of 2020. Congress stepped in and said, we're going to add more to the pie and make some additional adjustments so that at the end of the day, rather than having a 10.5% cut in the conversion factor, we would end up with a 3.3% reduction. To accomplish that, specifically what Congress did was increase the fee-for-service pie by 3.75%, so that's a spending increase. It then made adjustments to the Medicare sequestration because when in doubt, Congress will always make an adjustment to sequestration. And then importantly for our conversation, they imposed a moratorium on CMS paying for G2211 until January 1st of 2024. And thus we closed the door on G2211 and pretty much forgot all about it until we find ourselves with the 2024 Medicare position fee schedule final rule. CMS with the moratorium lifted now says we're going to start reimbursing 2211 beginning on January 1st of this year. The valuation will remain the same as it was in 2021 at just shy of a half an hour of view. Uh, the work RVU is 0 0.33. That will become relevant when Angie runs us through some important math. Um, that puts the national payment amount with the current conversion factor at $16. Um, we'll talk in just a second about what's going to happen to the conversion factor here in 2024. And we assume that Medicare Advantage um, will cover uh, this new code at the rate negotiated by the parties in their contract. There is, of course, a redistributive impact of uh, now reimbursing for 2211. So to calculate that impact, CMS now assumed that 38% of outpatient E&M outpatient e codes would be billed with this in 2024, eventually increasing up to 54%. So they assumed slower adoption and having the code apply to fewer services. And Valerie will walk us through the changes introduced in 2024 that result in that. So we go from a 90% assumption in 2021 down to a 54% assumption um, for 2024 as this code is being implemented. Of course, adding that new reimbursement into the pool means that you have to slice the pie differently. That means that by reimbursing 2211, there's going to be a 2% reduction in the conversion factor as compared to 2023, approximately 70 cents to pay for this change um, with the addition of G2211. Remember, the overall reduction this year in 2024, the conversion factor in total is 3.34% or $1.15. So as you can see, about two thirds of that conversion factor reduction in 2024 is attributable to the introduction of reimbursement for G2211. So what's that mean? It means you need to build G2211 to make up for the reduction in the conversion factor. And that's what we're here to talk about is when is it appropriate then to bill for 2211 so that you don't see this reduction in your Medicare reimbursement. Of course, there's always Congress and when they could step into this, or well, okay, leave it at that. Um, we are, as you know, in a extended process of budget negotiations on Capitol Hill. Certainly it is in the mix to correct the conversion factor going forward. There is red legislation that has been championed by the AMA that would revise the conversion factor to include an, inf an inflationary adjustment finally going forward. But we'll see how that all plays out. Again, we previously had circumstances where the conversion factor going into effect on January 1st was lower. Congress then stepped in and increased the conversion factor and CMS went back and paid retroactively that increased conversion factor. So that's still on the table. The question is, how will they pay for it? Um, and will that again be a cut to G2211? Certainly in the comment period, uh, when the proposed rule was published, we saw a division in the physician community because we had the Academy, American uh, 
College of Radiologists, the American College of Surgeons, several other special surgical specialty societies coming out against 2211. On the other side, American Academy of Family Physicians championing this code. Um, that's all settled down now with the final rule publication is everyone saying just increase the conversion factor. But I will just say there is that possibility out there that Congress cuts off 2211 as a way to pay for the conversion factor. It's on the table. It's not necessarily on the table, but it is an opportunity. So with that, let's turn this over to Valerie to talk about uh, the basics of this rule. Uh, not a rule. It's a code. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Pretty significant code, obviously. Um, but I'll tack on to what Marty was describing um, with this determination of what the valuation would be of this service and how to adjust the conversion factor and what you'll see in the final rule is that they're actually trying to contemplate the utilization of this code as opposed to the allowed utilization of this code so how many people are actually going to use this so that we don't reduce the conversion factor over you know too much to the point where you know it's in Medicare's advantage of this you know low utilization of the service and that they're just paying less overall for all of the services. So um, keep that in mind because just because they're contemplating certain things that would like reduce the utilization of the service doesn't necessarily mean that there's a limitation to your utilization of it. So we're going to talk about and dissect this code because the language in this code and the language that is used to support this within the manual and that you'll see you know, throughout even through MAC guidance and things like that are, are really important to understand and to really understand also the intent um, behind the code because if you get lost in the language, you can head down a road that is not intended. So let's start with a descriptor. The descriptor has two parts, and it's important to understand where these two parts start and end, because if you look at it the wrong way, you could interpret this completely differently. So the, the descriptor for the G2211 is visit complexity inherent to evaluation and management associated with the first part. So we're, we're starting with visit complexity, so the complexity of a service related to E&M services, so our evaluation and management visits, and specifically our office and outpatient E&M services. So these 99202 through 99215 are the only codes that we're talking about for this service. So your office-based services, um, one, with medical care services that serve as the continuing focal point for all needed healthcare services. So you're in a primary care setting, and you're the primary care provider, you are the focal point of all services that are rendered for that patient. So you're you know, referring out to other specialists and you know, making sure that care is performed and following up with the patient, and you're that continual focal point. That is the first scenario. The second scenario is with medical care services that are part of ongoing care related to a patient's single serious condition or a complex condition. So we've got a specialist type of scenario where we're providing ongoing care, but it is for a single serious condition or a complex condition. Medicare wanted to clarify in this final rule that this is for a serious condition, not just a single condition. So that is one important thing to note is that we're talking about something a little bit elevated than you know, a single just kind of routine you know, kind of a one and done, you'll see um, that language uh, that appears um, routinely and later on in the presentation. But what really what we're looking for is two scenarios, specialists and primary care providers that are likely predominantly serving the patient in the office or outpatient kind of clinic setting, and their predominant services are these E&M services because they're getting paid and reimbursed on these e &M services and they don't have the, all the procedural services to supplement what they're doing. And the argument that CMS and the authors that are writing the final rule are saying is that they believe that these office-based scenarios 
are not reimbursed at the level that they should be, such that when we revised the work RVUs in 2021, they still didn't increase to the level that would be necessary to pay for these types of cognitive services that are occurring in the office-based or clinic-based setting. And that the specialist services are in fact overpaid and so that we've got to regulate this back to something that is, or to something that is going to make more sense to make sure that we're paying for these services. I think what you're seeing is still a push towards value-based and bundled payment, but we're still in this fee-for-service world. So we're trying to get towards something and, and value things that are happening outside of your normal visit and fee-for-service, just face-to-face -face encounter. So they're, they're trying to bolster that. But one of you know, these bullets at the bottom of the slide are all of the things that we actually know at this point. So it's built again with those office-based E&M codes only. It's not limited to specific specialties. So that while, yes, the intent is really to cover these um, specialists that are really heavy on these E&M services, it doesn't limit other specialties from billing this. Um, it can be billed by your non-physician practitioners, your NPPs or APPs. You can bill this um, under their NPI. Um, you can also um, include this with your telehealth services. So you're billing an E&M on the same, you know, at, via telehealth, then you can include this G-code. But it's not available for RHCs and FQHCs because of the methodology that that's paid for. It's a non-inclusive rate. So Marty, we'll go to the next slide. And Valerie, one thing, I'm sorry, um, I know just for folks that are looking at it going, gosh, I didn't notice the one and the two. We added yeah. that for emphasis because we really wanted folks to understand those two criteria that you talked about, right? Right, because if, if you move that, you know, those phrasings over any, and you assume that the secondary part includes this focal point of service, then you're missing the concept between the two ideas. So yes, again, we added that. Thank you, Lori. Um, so when we look at the objective view of when we cannot build this, we have a push towards the 25 modifier. So the 25 modifier allows us to bill for a procedure in addition to an E&M on the same day. So that 25 modifier overcomes the edit against the E&M with that procedure that day. So what, again, this concept of if we have procedures, if we have a proceduralist focused provider, we're not intending to pay for this service and above and beyond that. So if you have a heavy proceduralist provider, you may not be looking to bill this, but it doesn't exclude you or preclude you from billing it. Um, one thing to note is that in the original fact sheet that was produced in 2021 associated with the release of the G2211, there was mention of payment modifiers that would not be assumed that these um, G codes would be billed with. So that included the 24 and 53 modifier. So keep in mind that there may be other payment modifiers that may be a risk to bill, but when we look at the change requests that came out at the end of the year that will eventually be applied around February 19th, will be applied to our Medicare Claims Processing Manual. Um, you'll see that the 25 modifier is the only modifier they include. You'll also see a lot of information from your MACs that say that they're including an edit against the 25 modifier. So the absolute edit that's intended at this point is the G2211 with your E&M with the 25 modifier. So if you're also doing a procedure on the same day as the E&M, you will not be able to build this. So you'll probably want to go ahead and build that type of edit in your own system. You know, and Valerie, so, this is why you see that utilization change from the assumed 90% down to the, right. the high 50s, because in 2021, CMS said we would expect not to see the, the, the code bill with mm -hmm. the modifier 25, but did not right. have this explicit prohibition that shows up in 2024. Right. So then the subjective um, portion, which is the reason why you're attending this presentation, is that the service billed by a practitioner who does not intend to have an ongoing longitudinal relationship with the beneficiary would not bill this service. 
So you would have to get into the mind of the provider and determine if they intend to continue to see this patient in order to do this in an automated fashion. And that is the complexity of this service. So how do we actually implement this in more of an automated fashion? Because it's going to be very difficult just to train providers to utilize this code at the right time, in the right place, et cetera. So we understand that that, that is really the issue. So let's move on to the next slide. So again, we have these two options. We're really looking for this longitudinal relationship. For primary care, the provider is that kind of hub. The, the spokes are all of the specialists and the primary care physician is that performing provider who's saying, okay, I need to take care of this patient for all of their care and I need to manage the patient, you know, longitudinally. And I need to have a relationship with this patient such that they're going to come back to me when they need services so then I can manage all of that care and that, that when they go to a specialist, I'll still be kind of managing how that's going and making sure that they're following up and all of that. For the specialist side, again, we're talking about ongoing care. So it's still a long, longitudinal relationship. They may be coming to you and they're, you know, you're determining that they have a certain diagnosis. It's a serious diagnosis. And so we're, you know, continuing to manage this patient longitudinally, an ongoing basis, and making sure that this patient is managed appropriately. It does not necessarily mean that it's a team-based approach. So the team-based type of language is really on that primary care setting, whereas the specialist may be the only one managing this patient for the service, but the cognitive load to make sure that the patient is returning and, and following their plan of care and following the services that they need and making sure they're, they're compliant with the treatment is, the service, is what they're paying for um, in this G-code. The documentation is the hard part, right? So when the when CMS is talking about documentation, they go back to, well, you're billing an E&M, so you have to support the fact that you're you have medical necessity for that E&M, and you have to support the medical decision making or time that is you know supporting the level of service billed. But they say there's no additional actual documentation that's required. Though what you'll see in the language is that types of um, language like plan of care or assessment and plan, um, the diagnoses that you're managing, um, the other services provided that are kind of, you know, creating the complexity of the visit there. So um, the specific visit itself, however, does not have to show some level of complexity. It's that the patient, you, you may be providing acute care one day and chronic care the next day, but it's the longitudinal relationship with that patient that really matters. So let's look at the next slide and see a few examples that are provided in, in an MLN update that was um, recently released. So the first one you see is sinus congestion. So PCP sees a patient for sinus congestion. I think what they're saying to you is that it really doesn't matter what they're seeing the patient for. This could be a self-limited or minor problem, but because the patient needs to be managed and because that provider has a relationship with that patient that is managing more than just that sinus congestion, they're managing the entirety of that patient making sure that patient is going to come back for their annual wellness visit, making sure that patient has all of their you know, routine um, needs taken care of, and that maybe they do have a condition that they need to go back to their you know, specialist to see, are they really being compliant with that? That visit uh, you know, would include all of those pieces because it's, it's your chance to actually make sure that all of those things are happening. So it really doesn't matter again what that the diagnosis is on that claim, it's the fact that you're needing to have that relationship and that you do have that relationship with that patient. When we flip over to the specialist side, we see a complex or serious condition in HIV. And HIV, in this situation, the patients miss several um, of their medication doses. So they're not compliant with their medication, but the provider would not have known that 
had they not had a relationship with that patient and the patient came clean with the fact that they'd missed some of their medication. And so they are working on that relationship and that it's the cognitive side of the, of the discussion and the medical decision-making that's going on inside the head of the provider that the, that this code is paying for. Now that, raises the issue with this documentation because oftentimes you're not going to be documenting the psychosocial type of issues that are going on with your relationship with the patient or with that patient that um, that may be something you don't want the patient to see ongoing. We see this oftentimes on the on the psychology side or psychiatry side that there's some things that just don't go in the record but you still have to show at least some type of continuity with this care to say, yes, I'm managing this patient and yes, they've missed some of their medication. And so we're trying to make sure that they're getting back on track. So I want to see them again in a month or two, that kind of thing. You're going to see those follow-up visits, which I would focus on is when do I need to see this patient again and including when and why. You know, I need to see this patient again for their AWV, or I need to see this patient again in three months to follow up on this issue. And showing that need to see that patient again will show that relationship. So let's look at the next slide. So we're starting to see some MAC guidance, and what you'll see is that this language that is displayed and especially highlighted is some of it is a little bit more than what we've seen in the final rule, but a lot of it is in the final rule. It was also included in the fact sheet um, that was out in 2021, then applied to the Medicare Claims Processing Manual around that time and in 2023. We do not have the full update again um, within the Medicare Claims process Processing Manual. That will happen in February 19th. That change request includes the new language that includes a lot of this language. So um, ongoing care that results in care personalized to the patient. So personalized to the patient is usually something that you hear when you've got a copy and paste scenario. We have a problem with issues with documentation where we just see the same care provided every single time. The, the Medicare contractors want to see and Medicare wants to see that you're personalizing the care to the patient, that this patient is being truly seen for this issue on this day and that you're managing them for all of these other things going on. That it's comprehensive. Again, this kind of concept that is more on value-based care where you're actually managing everything that's going on. You're following up on what's going on with, you know, they went to the GI pro provider and now, you know, they had a endoscopy. How's that patient doing? Do they need to come back to you for additional care? You're following through with all of that care, but that is outside of the service that may not qualify for chronic care management. It may not qualify for principal care management, but what this um, describes in the final rule is, is that this is, you know, addressing services that are not qualifying for CCM and PCM, but that are, you know, indeed um, services outside of what is paid for today. At the bottom here, we've got um, every patient would be unique with their healthcare needs and templated language for add-on code may not support medical necessity. So what that's saying is please don't add a line in every single note that says I'm providing the longitudinal, comprehensive and continuous relationship for this patient because it's not necessarily going to support that you are. You have to reflect it in the record that you are actually providing that. And again, I think the follow-up timing and what the need is in your in your um, uh, CC, your uh, chief complaint, you'll want to make sure that you're saying, you know, now I'm seeing the patient for follow-up for this condition and what's going on today and the patient complains of this and this is what's going on. So you're showing that, that continuity of care. We've been asking for this a, for a long time in the record and EHRs have made it very difficult to get this into the record, but this, this G code will all the more give you reason to add this kind of context into the record. Yeah, so Valerie, is it fair to say there's no more work involved, it's just how you capture what you're doing in the medical record documentation to support the code? 
Right. And it can be inferred, right? So like, it doesn't necessarily have to be explicitly detailed within the record. You just have to show that you are in fact providing that longitudinal care, but it only has to show one visit because your one visit may show that you have intent to provide long-term care for that patient. That's all you have to do. So it's that one, that one visit is going to be the most difficult to support. Having multiple visits, especially during the year, at least annual visits will show it better, but um, you don't have to necessarily do more work. Well, you don't have to do more work. They're saying they're trying to pay you for the work that you're already doing. So if you're like us, you have a million questions as to how this is actually going to be implemented and where are the risk areas and how does it apply in specific circumstances? And let's go back to January 24th, where CMS had its open door forum for physicians, nurses, and allied health professionals. If you're not familiar with the open door, open door forums, these are sort of semi-regular um, calls that CMS sponsors with experts uh, from the agency who will introduce new new initiatives, um, introduce new MLN articles, and then open themselves up for questions. Um, and this in, in this open door forum, they introduced the MLN article that uh, Valerie discussed, and then a very brave person named Eric Carrera from CMS took to the lines to answer questions that people posed. Now, and in preface to answering those questions, he said that they have received numerous uh, inquiries through the Medicare Physician Fee Schedule.cms.gov. Um, that web, that email address you can send questions to, and that they are in fact planning to publish a comprehensive FAQ on 2211. It's coming soon. Uh, we haven't seen it yet. Also, note that there was no, the transcript has not yet been published for the January 24th Open Door Forum. So what we're going to share here is Marty's best recollection. Uh, she's getting older, so we kind of worry about Marty's best recollection, but I was carefully taking notes um, and only included here what I was quite certain I heard. So let's go down some of the topics and questions that were asked during that Open Door Forum for some insight. And number one was, can you build this code with new patients? Because how do you have a longitudinal relationship with a new patient? Well, it's very obvious you can build a code with 2211 because they included the new patient codes as part of the purview of this particular um, code. And so what the CMS official said is if the practitioner anticipates that they're going to be assuming this role as focal point, either as the PCP or to manage a specific condition on an ongoing basis, then it would be appropriate to build 2211. We'd be looking for things like documenting an assessment and plan, are you ordering tests? Are you scheduling subsequent visits and the like? All of that's going to support 2211, not necessarily required for 2211. But if it's more of a second opinion uh, as the reason you're seeing the patient, if it's a one and done, and that language was used frequently uh, during this open door forum, if it's one or done, then it would not be appropriate uh, to see to build 2211. Uh, the speaker emphasized that CMS does not intend to dictate or direct how patients are managed in your practice. They're not going to say, you have to order this test, you have to see them this frequently instead, uh, or, or that you have to at least see them once annually to have a longitudinal relationship. What the medical reviewers are looking for is, is the practitioner providing care consistent with the practitioner's usual practice for managing a patient over time? And so that becomes the key there. Valerie, I'll let you take the next one. All right, so when we talk about primary care provider or the provider that is the specialist seeing the patient, it's easy to say, okay, well, that's the provider that's doing that. But what if you have a provider that is the primary care provider and he goes on vacation and that provider while on vacation has a physician within the practice that is seeing patients in his stead. So if you have a physician seeing a patient in that primary care provider stead, then you could build the G code because that provider is serving in that physician's stead. Similarly, 
if you have a non-physician practitioner, an NPP or APP, that is providing services incident to that physician. But of course, we have to bill the incident to service under the supervising provider that was actually in the office. Then you can still do that because that NPP is providing those services incident to that primary care provider service, even though you're billing under a different provider. So what we have here is this kind of practice, not the practitioner concept, but also it's as if you know you have that one identified provider, but the provider uh, providers in the practice are providing service when that other practitioner is not available. So that would still allow you to build that G code. Yeah, and in the discussion, he made specific reference to this established patient criteria, right? Mm -hmm. Seen by, seen by a physician in the practice in the same same practice, same specialty within the last three years. Sort of, he yeah. referenced specifically that established patient standard for considering mm -hmm. when it's appropriate to bill twenty two eleven. Right. So then um, the residence scenario that was mentioned during the open door forum was um, also considered allowed. So we, the question was, can you bill low level visits um, for that primary care under the primary care exception for the residents? So in this primary care ex exception, of course, you have a proctoring physician who is present in the suite and the resident is allowed to see low level services for you know independently basically the physician does not have to come in um, the proctoring physician does not have to come into the office you know into the um suite uh, in, into the actual room with the with the patient and does not have to document um you know part of the visit or key components of the visit so because of that that was the question um there but this is similar to the last scenario where the, the provider is providing something incident to that primary care physician. So you have a proctoring physician that's serving as that oversight and that lead in the care of the patient. And then you have the resident kind of serving as a proxy to that physician. And so then you're allowed to build that G code because of that scenario. And I think if you can think of it like that, then it doesn't matter what the scenario is, you can build that G code. Uh, there's a question asked by a rheumatology practice that if the rheumatology practice is managing a patient, does that qualify as being the focal point for 2211? Um, again, the response was, we're not going to provide you a list of serious or complex conditions. We're going to instead look to the medical record documentation that should indicate whether the condition itself is going to require ongoing medical management. One thing to note here, though, is I think and Valerie pointed this out at the beginning, the code has two paths, the focal point and ongoing care. Focal mm -hmm. point goes to primary care, um, ongoing care goes to the specialist. So in this case, it wouldn't necessarily make the rheumatologist the focal point of care, but instead providing that ongoing care, whether it be for rheumatoid arthritis or lupus or the like. Uh, we also had a question regarding the frequency of how often can you bill 2211? Uh, again, the response was there are no limits on the frequency of billing the code. It attaches to the E&M service, nor is there any requirement as the minimum frequency that you have to see the patient to bill for 2211. Um, there was one where uh, the CMS official just took a pass uh, when they were asked the question, can you bill 2211 um, on the same day that you bill a prolonged care code? Um, and the response was, will address this in the FAQ. So it is good to, it's, it's, it's appreciative, we should be appreciating, they are taking this very seriously, thinking through the implications as they wait to publish the FAQs. So I think, Marty, I think we will likely see the prolonged care code excluded um, so that if you bill prolonged care that, that it wouldn't be allowed because the concept of that day service being increased based on that prolonged service as opposed to CCM and PCM types of services where it's like truly um, outside and like through the month type of service versus this cognitive load on that day. So um, so we'll see how this turns out, but at this point, it's not precluded from, from billing. Right. Um, questions on documentation, again, just targeting back to how 
Valerie described this, there are no specific magic words, no new documentation is required. And again, the focus in the medical review would be on the EMM VISA documentation and whether that's reflecting ongoing care or this, again, this term one and done visit. Because our, our concern is the, the distance between one and done and longitude, you know, ongoing care, how far do we get between the two? But that's where we have the, the gray space this way. Finally, a question on team-based care, and it was a very specific question because it was asked by um, uh, the, the caller was a part of the transplant program. And they said, as part of our transplant program, we have team-based care. Can all the team members then bill for 2211? Um, and the response was, if the team members are actively participating in that patient's code, it'd be appropriate to include the add-on code on services that they provide. Again, very specific example on team-based care. It'll be interesting to see how much broader CMS is willing to take this um, on this on the team of uh, providers managing a patient's care. Okay, enough on the nitty-gritty details of what this code looks like. Let's turn this over to Lori to add some practicality to this discussion. Thank you, Marty. There are still many nitty gritty details, even as we look at implementation considerations. So presumably this doesn't change. I think Marty and Valerie covered pretty uh, sufficiently that this doesn't really change how providers see their patients. And we've clarified that there are, there are no specific documentation requirements, um, but it does require those considerations of the provider's relationships with the patients. <clears throat> um, but it would require changes in billing processes. So if we break it down into a couple of different buckets, I think the first one is, is really when to implement it. So we've referenced that these FAQs are still um, outstanding. We, we know they're coming soon, uh, to quote Marty in the, in the air quotes, soon, but we don't know what soon looks like. Um, and so, you know, is there enough information for you to confidently move forward right now? If you're on the fence, we would generally recommend waiting for that soon to be released FAQ. But if you're a go, if you're already uh, implementing this or you're close to implementing this, then we would encourage you to capture your basis for that approach and your considerations, and then document how you are operationalizing this into a written policy and procedure. Then obviously when new information comes out, you know we'll be writing on it or talking about it, it will be well covered, and make sure at that point that you are revisiting your policy and procedure and that you'd make some updates accordingly. So then if we flip over to think about who we want to implement this for, um, I know Valerie referenced early on uh, the Medicare Advantage, uh, maybe Marty referenced the Medicare Advantage coverage. Consider that G codes are CMS codes, so they may or may not be adopted by other payers. It's in their discretion to do so. There aren't specific rules as to whether the MA plans will actually pay for the code because, um, you know, some may adopt a may adopt coverage from a fee-for-service contract, but if your providers, your MA plans are under a value-based or capitated rate, the MA plan may determine that this is already considered in that rate. So we really don't know for certain what that will look like in a true payment in the door kind of scenario. Keep in mind that commercial payers have the option to adopt or not adopt, it's at their discretion, and the same for Medicaid. So at the end of the day, what we really, really know is CMS will cover it uh, for traditional Medicare, and then the others are maybes uh, at best. So then that shifts over to considerations really on how to implement it. And so you first have to decide based on, you know, kind of what we know, where you will fall on are we going to submit this code across all applicable visits regardless of the payer, absent other information or guidance at this point. There's a couple of impacts that you have to think of through as you're evaluating that um, consideration. Obviously, we'll get the increased reimbursement for Medicare. You may get increased reimbursement from other payers. You may increase your write-offs or your contractual adjustments from payers who do not pay. Since it's a non-covered service, perhaps for them, that may mean that it's not a separately billable service to the patient unless you follow your contract protocols for patient notification of non-covered services. So you would have to evaluate that, put in a process to get that patient consent most of the time in writing, have that documented and available if the payer were to non-cover it and you wanted to, to bill the patient. 
There may be a change to your gross collection rate and your accounts receivable if you are adding these services and thus the charges and um, perhaps not getting across the board reimbursement. So as you're evaluating shifts in your gross collection rate and your AR balances, um, you just need to monitor to see if you need to reset for a corrected expected rate on those two, two um, key performance indicators. On the other side, though, you really shouldn't see an impact to your adjusted collection rate because remember that already takes into account, you know, what you're collecting of the collectible dollar. So it already takes out the impact of those contractual adjustments. So you're, you shouldn't see necessarily a change in your adjusted collection rate. If your providers are paid on a work RVU model, you will see an increase in those work RVUs, um, but depending on your payer reimbursement, you may only receive in increased collections for a portion of that volume. So Angie's going to dig into the, those considerations in just a few minutes because there are several that you will need to work through. If you're trying to, as we're thinking through, we've talked about you know, how we're going to uh, you know, consider for all of your patients, um, are we going to do just certain, just straight Medicare, for example, it's really trying to figure out then how to determine when to physically bill the service. So um, we spent a lot of time discussing the operationalization of this. How would you really uh, process it? So for example, would you have your practitioners decide at the time of service that this service qualifies for G2211? And if so, um, how would they notate that? We don't have to have a specific documentation in their record. Might they have a checkbox in their documentation? That would be predicated on your EMR functionality. And then obviously training uh, your providers to, to be thinking about that and then checking it consistently. Gets a little more complicated if you're only doing it for traditional Medicare and you're not doing it for other, um, other payers. It's hard to operationalize just for one uh, subset of your patient base. You could have your Billers review uh, documentation and apply the code, you know, on a one by one case by case basis. That'd be pretty labor intensive, um, especially because they may not be reviewing all of the ENMs in that scenario. And again, trying to figure out a way to effectively operationalize it. Depending on your EMR uh, structure, you could potentially set a rule, uh, you know, and if this, then that uh, scenario, again, predicated on the decisions that you made through the earlier analysis. From a risk perspective, we feel like a conservative approach would be to bill this for, um, if you wanted to take a baby step, uh, to only bill it for established patients because that would define a more clear longitudinal relationship through that repeat visit uh, process. But again, Marty just covered a few minutes ago, you can bill this for new patients in certain circumstances. So again, it's a risk tolerance uh, consideration there. We also were talking about if you are providing care management services such as chronic care management or principal care management, then you, you have clearly established a longitudinal relationship with that patient and um, could be even a more conservative approach if you just, uh, you know, started with your CCM, PCM roster as you started to have EM visits with those patients that you've, you've got that confidence that you, you've been able to support that relationship. Regardless of all of those, again, documentation will be key, especially when we're in those scenarios with changing information. So based on what you know right now, here's what you are determining to do within your practice. Here are the policies and procedures you're going to put into place as to who you're going to bill, how you're going to bill, when you're going to bill, documenting all of that, providing good effective training for your providers and your staff. Um, monitoring for updates and then refining those policies and procedures and training, just rinse and repeat as you have new information, making sure that you're staying current um, with any changes that we get through, through subsequent updates. So I think that, you know, you've got a lot to consider as you evaluate um, where it falls for you if you're an early adopter or if you're going to, to wait and be um, a little bit more measured in your approach. Um, but at the end of the day, documenting all of those considerations will be, will be important and then just staying on top of it as more information comes out. Angie, how about we dig into the compensation considerations because I think that's going to be interesting for folks. Yes, but wait, there's more. Right. So we've talked about the revenue integrity side of this. We've talked about the compliance side, the coding side. We've talked about the operational side of this, implementing this code. So now let's talk about physician practices and how this may impact your physicians. So we're going to take this conversation and, and take to the end of the, the 
discussion today really in two buckets. One, independent physicians, and then two, secondly, hospital employed physicians. So let's start with independent physicians first. So the economic alignment of this change is a little bit more clear on the independent physician side. So to the extent that you are able to bill the code, there is an increased reimbursement to your practice. As Marty shared earlier, that increase to your practice for billing that code for Medicare patients um, is $16.05 per code. So that multiplied by the number of times that you're using that code within your practice is going to be the, the pickup to your practice and a direct impact to your bottom line. PYA's estimation, and if you follow along with me, and this is a estimation based upon several assumptions, if your assumptions in your practice are different, then the numbers will change. But let's assume a patient panel of about 2,500 patients. Let's assume that your Medicare and Medicare Advantage, let's assume that Medicare Advantage is also going to allow for this code, is about half of that. Let's assume earlier in the presentation, we talked about about 40% of this time the code will be used. So let's use that. And let's assume four visits a year related to this particular patient. So in this instance, this physician is going to have about 2,000 visits a year related that would be billing the, the G2211. At $16.05 each, that's the national reimbursement, so that's another assumption that the audience would need to take into consideration that your reimbursement may be different, but then that's an additional $32,100 to your practice estimated. So then what can you do with that? It's an economic benefit to your practice um, that could be used to um, pay your physicians. It could be used to invest in the practice related to other value-based models and preparing for other value-based models. The increase in reimbursement, it seems, is what CMS has intended to do, is to allow more compensation for the care, the longitudinal care uh, of the patient under this code. So it's much more direct for a physician practice. Uh, Primary care physicians and medical specialists are going to see that $32,100 amount that I shared a moment ago. Proceduralists, it's going to depend. It's going to depend for the proceduralist how many G2211s that they're able to bill and will that offset the conversion factor reduction that we talked about um, about almost an hour ago now um, when we talked about that, that reduction. So, for your proceduralists in private practice, it's a little bit of a different economic model and may not be the increase to your practice that our primary care uh, physicians and medical specialists are, are going to uh, potentially uh, receive from this. So Marty, if you'll move forward. So when we think about the hospital employed physicians or contracted physicians, the economic alignment model becomes a little bit more complicated right? So about 65% of physicians are paid on a productivity-based model, so work RVUs. So if we think about the work RVUs related to the G2211, uh, 0.33 work RVUs. So in this discussion here a moment ago with independent physicians, we were focused on reimbursement collections into the practice at, at 1605, now that we're on the other side of the brain, talking about an employed or contracted physician, we're talking about, about work RVUs. So work RVUs, 0.33 for each of those, uh, those codes. So again, if we take our example a moment ago and just pull it through to the employed physician, 2,000 visits a year, at 0.33 work RVUs each, that's about 660 additional work RVUs for a primary care physician. If we assume about a $50 conversion factor compensation per work RVU for each of those 660 work RVUs, that's about $33,000 additional compensation to that physician for that work, okay? This is just an example. So this is where decision making comes, right? So number one, the increase of compensation to the physician, the first question to ask is, is the practice receiving 
reimbursement to offset that additional compensation to the physician. My math indicates that the break-even conversion factor, I use 50 in my example, at 50, you're losing slightly on every work RVU using that 1605 um, reimbursement, national reimbursement. The break-even conversion factor is about $48.64. So if your conversion factor is over $48, bless you, Marty Ross, over $48.64, then you are losing slightly on contractually between your reimbursement and your compensation per work RVU paid out. Under $48.64 uh, a work RVU, you're not, you're not losing on that code. You're not paying out everything to the physician that you're receiving in reimbursement. Um, keep in mind that my example just now was focused on only Medicare or Medicare Advantage patients. So in the employed and contracted physician scenario, to the extent that the physicians are using the G2211 on for all patients running through your system, then 0.33 work RVUs are accumulating in the work RVU attribution for the physician without potential reimbursement offset. Because again, in my assumption, we are receiving potential reimbursement offset from Medicare and Medicare Advantage. So that would be something that you'll need to consider uh, related to this code and the physician's work RBU attribution as to, you know, are you going to accumulate work RBUs for all payers or are you just going to accumulate this code and the related work RBUs for CMS and Medicare Advantage and the payer and the payers when they decide <laughs> which payers decide that they will actually pay for this code. Um, so we need to be thinking through these things. And again, you know, we talked about there was conversation uh, within our, our time together about the purpose of this code. CMS is recognizing that the work is being done and they're trying to reimburse for the work that's being done. So philosophically, from the employed and, and contracted physician side of things, your philosophy needs to be developed as to whether you are going to pay the physician more for work that was already being done, or you're going to go along with CMS and say, this is work that was not previously compensated, and now there is a potential catch up for that work being done. And how are you going to accomplish that catch up from a physician compensation perspective all at once? Or do you want to choose a budget neutral approach? So if we think back to um, when all of those ENM work RVU changes occurred, um, substantial. That was substantial for our physician practices and our hospital and employed and contracted physicians. And at that time, many of you froze your work RVU attribution and accumulation to the 2020 Medicare Physician Fee Schedule so that you could implement some budget neutrality measures from a physician compensation perspective. So this is not to the extent of that change that occurred um, in 2021, um, but it is something to pay attention to um, from both a financial statement, a practice income statement perspective, as well as a physician compensation perspective. Um, I've focused my conversation and my examples on the primary care physici physicians and the medical, uh, medical specialists, and not so much the proceduralists. Mm -hmm. Same thing goes here, um, but to the extent that the proceduralist is using a G2211, it is likely that their work RVU conversion factor is higher than 50. So we need to be thinking about that um, on the hospital employed physician side, understanding that it is not likely that the reimbursement uh, will offset um, the proceduralist use of that code. However, but we know that the collections have also gone down overall. Um, related to that Medicare uh, conversion factor. So a lot to consider here. Um, 
from from a physician perspective, um, this is a a gift. This G code is a gift that um, that does keep on giving, and there are many facets um, to understand regarding its um, the process and implementation. Marty, I'm going to turn it over to you to wrap us up before we it's wrap up the wheel. It's, it's just interesting that you know for CMS, it's just one pie, and it's how you cut the pie. And so, if you increase compensation to primary care. It's going to decrease compensation to proceduralists. For those who employ physicians, that's probably not an option. Um, so the implementation certainly will be more challenging. Well, that wraps it up um, for G2211. As Valerie said, as new developments come out, we will certainly be commenting on that, keep you up to date as much as possible. Um, future healthcare regulatory roundups um, upcoming. Just a second, if I can get there. Um, oops. It always jumps too far, doesn't it? Um, on February 21st, I'm going to be joined by Tracy Wall. We're going to talk about opportunities with rural health clinics and their changing regulations and reimbursement. And then on March 6th, we have a true treat for you. Barry Mathis uh, will take over uh, the microphone and talk about changes to federal and state cybersecurity landscape, some new guidance that came out this month. Um, he'll delve into that deeper, provide some really practical, useful guidance for you all in those matters. So with that, Back to you, Caitlin, to take us home. Thank you so much. And thanks to our presenters, Valerie, Marty, Lori, and Angie. Just please remember to stay on the line once the webinar disconnects to complete a short survey. Later today, you will receive an email with their contact information and a recording of the webinar. Also, the slides and recordings for every episode of PYA's Healthcare Regulatory Roundup series are available on the Insights page of PYA's website, which is pyapc.com. While at our website, you may register for other PYA webinars and learn more about the full range of services offered by PYA. Please remember to stay on the line once the webinar disconnects to complete a short survey and post any questions you may have. On behalf of PYA, thank you for joining us, and we hope you have a great rest of your day.